DiscerningHearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Dr. Lillis is an associate professor and the academic dean of St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, California, as well as the academic advisor for the Juan Diego House of Priestly Formation for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from his lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He's the author of Hidden Mountain Secret Garden, a Theological Contemplation of Prayer, as well as numerous other books focused on the spiritual life. In this series of conversations with Dr. Lillis, we discuss the letters of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. Beginning to pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. To Abbe Chevenard, June 14, 1903, Dijon Carmel. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Monsieur l'Abbé, it seems to me that nothing better expresses the love in God's heart than the Eucharist. It is union, consummation. He in us, we in him. And isn't that heaven on earth? Heaven in faith, while awaiting the face-to-face vision we so desire. Then we will be satisfied when his glory appears, when we see him in his light. Don't you find that the thought of this meeting refreshes the soul? This talk with him whom it loves solely? Then everything disappears, and it seems that one is already entering into the mystery of God. This whole mystery is so much ours, as you said to me in your letter. Oh, pray, won't you, that I may live fully my bridal dowry, that I may be wholly available, wholly vigilant in faith, so the Master can bear me wherever he wishes. I wish to stay always close to him who knows the whole mystery, to hear everything from him. The language of the word is the infusion of the gift. Oh yes, it is really so, isn't it, that he speaks to our soul in silence. I find this dear silence a blessing. From Ascension to Pentecost, we were in retreat in the cynical, waiting for the Holy Spirit, and it was so good. During the whole octave, we have the Blessed Sacrament exposed in the oratory. Those are divine hours spent in this little corner of heaven where we possess the vision and substance under the humble host. Yes, he whom the Blessed contemplate in light and we adore in faith is really the same one. The other day someone wrote me such a beautiful thought. I send it on to you. Faith is the face-to-face in darkness. Why wouldn't it be so for us, since God is in us, and since he asks only to take possession of us as he took possession of the saints? Only they were always attentive, as Père Valet says. They are silent, recollected, and their only activity is to be the being who receives. Let us unite ourselves, therefore, Father, in making happy him who has loved us exceedingly, as St. Paul says. Let us make a dwelling for him in our soul that is wholly at peace, in which the canticle of love, of thanksgiving, is always being sung. And then that great silence the echo of the silence that is in God. Then, as you said, let us approach the all-pure, all-luminous Virgin, that she may present us to him whom she has penetrated so profoundly, and may our life 
be a continual communion, a holy, simple movement toward God. Pray to the Queen of Carmel for me. I, for my part, pray fervently for you, I assure you, and I remain with you in adoration and love. Sister Marie Elizabeth of the Trinity, RCI You know, just a little bit of a backdrop. In 1904, uh, the the chapel, when she writes this, the chapel will be closed a year after this. Uh, the church will close it, but the church is closing it because of pressure from the French government. This is a society that is com- in complete turmoil and has become uh, turned against the church. Elizabeth doesn't refer to any of this directly. Instead of worrying about the extrinsic things going on in the church, her heart is turned towards a deeper reality. She founds herself in the reality that the beatific vision isn't a future eventuality or possibility, but the beatific vision is a vision that is crashing in on us right now, and it's crashing in on us first and foremost, through the gift of the Blessed Sacrament, which when we die and and are in heaven, we will be given the light of glory. We'll see God face to face. We'll become like him because we'll see him face to face. But that uh, becoming like unto God, that divine likeness is something that already begins in this life because what we will see, the one we will see face to face in glory, we already behold face-to-face in faith, the substance that is seen in heaven is already present to us right now in the, in the Eucharist. And all we need to do is approach Jesus and believe in that love that is there. She calls it an immense love. This is such a, a powerful thought. I'm aware of people today who are struggling with their vocation, and one of their struggles is is they're filled with self-loathing. They just, their whole, they feel like their whole life has been a mistake, that they have completely failed in every way, and that there's no way forward for them, that they've blown it so bad there's no going back, and they don't see any way for them to go forward either, and so they hate themselves and they hate their life, their own life. And we have brothers and sisters today who, who feel this way, and. They feel this way, they're in this state, sometimes because of things they've done and sometimes because of things that have been done to them, usually a combination of, of both. And Elizabeth is speaking into, right into this right now. She is saying, giving us a way forward, and the way forward, out of self-loathing, out of accusing oneself and pathway of self-pity, is to look out on the love of God this love so present to us in the Eucharist, withdraw from all the external excitements, things that are kind of extrinsic to the deeper matters of the heart, withdraw from those and turn to the deepest matter of the heart. And the deepest matter of the heart is God's immense love that is personally present to us right now in this moment. And in the Blessed Sacrament, the immensity of that love the substance of it is made present to us in, in a singularly privileged way. It's given to us in that sacrament so that the, our knowledge and our love for the one who's present to us inside has nourishment or strength through the Blessed Sacrament. She captures all of this in this letter. This letter challenges us in the way we look at heaven. A lot of people look at heaven and what they see in heaven is kind of this boring place that's very passive and people are in a kind of lived in this dreamlike like existence. But what she's saying is heaven, when we see God for who he is in the light of glory, this transforms the deepest part of our being in love and by love and for love. We become most fully who we are in heaven. We live life with a greater intensity and a greater beauty 
we're able to give ourselves to one another in heaven. While that awaits us, that image and likeness of the Holy Trinity for the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit give themselves one to the other in this perfect communion of love and knowledge, uh, this perfect exchange, which they're wholly surrendered to one another. When we see that face to face, it's going to enable us to give ourselves. But that reality, that total gift of self, that, that total thriving, that love and strength that goes beyond every weakness, every void, every inadequacy, that's not simply something for the future. It's something breaking in on us right now. And again, it's what is given to us in the Blessed Sacrament. This is what heaven and faith means. It's such a paradox, isn't it, in so many ways, Anthony? Because for some of us, we Elizabeth has helped us over and over again to see that he is in us. You know, remain in me, and I'm in you. And he it's ever so present. And yet the Eucharist seems to be something that is out there, and then we receive it, and then he is present. It's difficult to understand the, the continual and the continuity of the presence of him. And is that something, a mystery that we're capable of grasping? Well, it's not so much that we, we grasp it, but it is a matter of the understanding, allowing the understanding of it to reconstitute the stand we take in life, the way we choose to live. And, and as we make that choice, it's a choice that's open to an interior transformation of our whole being. We don't grasp this truth that you've just said. We allow the understanding of it to flood our souls and change who we are. Mm. Um, it, uh, heaven in faith, this is what the whole mystery of the Blessed Sacrament evokes for us. When we come into the presence, the Eucharistic presence of the Lord, we've walked into the presence of heaven. And with our, our physical eyes, even when Jesus is in the tabernacle, we're beholding a reality that is already transforming us. It is a reality that is outside us in the sense that we are in this reality. And when you're in that reality, we're in the Eucharist. We behold the Eucharist because we're in the Eucharist. But it's also a reality that is paradoxically in us too. The Eucharist, it means Thanksgiving. The Thanksgiving of Jesus is already born in our hearts in a permanent way at the moment of baptism. There's a character that's conferred in us, and that character binds us to Jesus and so that his Thanksgiving, his Eucharist, is what lives in our hearts. We receive the Eucharist, we behold the Eucharist, and it strengthens this bond with Jesus so that his Thanksgiving becomes what floods our life more and more. This is why she loves this statement. Faith is the face-to-face -face in darkness. Faith is the face-to-face -face in darkness. Why wouldn't it be so for us, since God is in us, and since he asks only to take possession of us as he took possession of the saints? Only they were always attentive, as Père Valais says. They are silent, recollected, and their only activity is to be the being who receives. Let us unite ourselves, therefore, Father, in making happy him who has loved us exceedingly, as St. Paul says. face to face in darkness. Jesus, whom we will behold in the light of glory, just as he is. Right now we behold him in this darkness, in this under this veil, where we believe he's there even though we can't see him. And simply by believing that he's there, even though we can't see him, it deepens our bond with him. And as that bond increases, our ability to offer the thanksgiving 
that he's put in our hearts, his own thanksgiving that he's put in our It becomes stronger and stronger. The more we're bonded with Jesus in this vision of faith, uh, faith in darkness, the deeper that bond, the more he communicates his thanksgiving to us, the more his thanksgiving presence that is in us becomes stronger and can, takes over more and more of our life. There's this direct kind of connection between then faith and glory, what's going on inside us and what's going on outside us, what we are in and what is in us. It, it, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful context or, or, or mystery to begin to ponder. You know, there's a particular line too that I think really challenging, Anthony, and when she speaks, let us make a dwelling for him in our soul that is wholly at peace in which the canticle of love of thanksgiving is always being sung. It, are we capable today in this particular environment we're in with all the noise that comes continually around us to have a soul that is wholly at peace? Can we do that? Yes. <laughs> you, you know, this is, this is something God gives us grace to do. Every time we receive communion, we're being strengthened to open our souls for this peace to reign in our hearts. And very particularly to open our souls, to avail ourselves of this kind of peace, to make ourselves a dwelling for this peaceful presence of the risen Lord so that he can offer this song of love and thanksgiving. For that to be there, that we, we, she speaks of a, a great silence well, what constitutes that great silence? And there's two, really, let, let me see, there's three movements. The first movement of it is renunciation. There are things in our lives, in our hearts, in our imaginations, attachments, that are crowding out the peace of God in our life. And the attachment can be to something silly, and it can be to something sinful. It might be to something that's good, but not God's will for you. Whatever it is, we've got to say no. This is why fasting, having the regular practice of fasting in your life is so important. And fasting sometimes includes turning off the media and turning off the radio music in the car and just saying no sometimes the fasting is even more painful than that, though. You come home from work, and all you want to do is sit in your lazy chair and put your feet up, and you get home from work, and you see your chair, and you, you see your favorite newspaper laying right there, and you're all ready to go right there, and somebody in the household asks for your help, or you're aware, even before they ask for your help, that there's someone in your house that needs your personal presence. And so you renounce the comfort and the convenience of what you want to do when you want to do it. You renounce that self-indulgence and taking that satisfaction to spend a little bit of time being present to the person that God has called you to be present to. That's a renunciation, and that makes space in your heart for a great silence and a peace. So that's the first thing is renunciation. Mm -hmm. And it happens a thousand times a day in all kinds of little ways. We can, we can choose to make space in our hearts by choosing not to be self-indulgent, not to be seeking our own satisfaction or the easy way or the comfortable or the convenient. But we, we make space when we choose to do what is loving or we renounce things that are less than loving from our lives. The, the second way is that we make space or that space is made in us, is that God is going to send us things that humble and crush us. And when those things come that humble and crush us, we can fight against the goad. We can try to fight for control over our lives so that we're back in control again and, and not vulnerable to what's going on around us. Or we can surrender to what God's doing. Uh, we live in a time right now where there's a lot of pain in the church that has surfaced because those who are in leadership in all kinds of different levels of leadership have betrayed and denied 
and abandoned the little ones. And we are hurting right now either because we're one of the little ones who experienced that from leaders, or we're hurting right now because we know little ones who've been in that place and our heart aches for them. If that's your experience, this is God who's using this horrific time and, and these horrific failures in the church. He's using these things, just like he used the external events in Elizabeth's time, to help open your heart so that it can be a dwelling place, a place of deep silence, a place of peace. And when your heart is opened by these, by your compassion for others or your attempt to forgive those who've hurt you, betrayed you or denied you or abandoned you, whatever it might be, when you put your heart in that place, you're making space for for God's peace and silence to reign there. It opens your heart up to be a dwelling for the Word. And it's the Word, it's the Word who offers when these horrific things happen and you you either you forgive, you surrender. God, where is your love in this? I feel so crushed by what's just happened. Uh, to someone I love, to myself, to people I don't even know. I feel so crushed right now. Help me to surrender this to you. You're making space for the word to enter your heart. And it's the word, the word of the Father that raises up a powerful hymn of praise in you, a, a canticle of love. It's the word of the Father, Jesus, the word made flesh, that when you open your soul, he, he comes into you and is present in you in a new way. He was present before, but now he's going to be present in a new way because you've made space for him to dwell in your, you. And Jesus, the word of the Father, is so rich and so great, so beautiful. He comes constantly in every ever new ways. Every time you make a renunciation, every time you make one of these acts of surrender, or reparation, reparation of compassion or efforts to forgive. Every time you do something like this, he comes into you in a, in a new way. So he permits these very, very difficult external trials to come. And then there's, there's a third way that space is made in your heart. And it's, it's the most painful way, but it's also the most fruitful way. And not everyone experiences this all the time, but just in case someone's listening right now who has experienced this, and that is sometimes to create the space in us, the space in which there's enough room for the word to come in new ways, God takes away the consolation of his presence from our hearts. God seems to be far away from us. We feel like we've done something to anger him because he doesn't seem present. We feel like he's abandoned us, where we feel so alone. Elizabeth is also saying at this moment, when she's talked about faith and darkness, um, heaven and faith, she's saying in this particular moment that if you believe in God's presence anyway, you are making space for the word to dwell in you. You are making space for this canticle of love to echo throughout the chambers of your heart and resound throughout the whole universe. Of those times where God seems furthest away, if you believe in his presence and his love, it's at those times his love is actually more powerfully transforming you and making your life fruitful and full in ways that be, exceed your ability to be aware of or even understand. And Elizabeth is saying all of this comes to us through the Eucharist because the Eucharist is a foretaste of heaven. It's, it's the substance of what awaits us in heaven given to us right now in faith. It's such a message of hope. It is. It is a very hopeful message. And I, I think we need words of hope for our time today. I, I think because it's a message of hope, this is one of the reasons why she turns to Mary, the mother of God. 
let us approach the all-pure, all-luminous Virgin, that she may present us to him whom she has penetrated so profoundly, and may our life be a continual communion, a holy, simple movement toward God. Pray to the Queen of Carmel for me. I, for my part, pray fervently for you, I assure you, and I remain with you in adoration and love. Mary is the one who is in holy, simple movement to God because she has perfectly surrendered herself. The deeper you penetrate into God, the more simple you become, the more simple your movement becomes. And that simple movement makes you more fruitful. In Mary's case, she is the fruitful mother of the church, and she is teaching us to make this fruitful surrender too. So when I talked about the three things, you know, you might say daily renunciations, external trials, and then interior trials, those three things are what make space for the word to dwell in us. We don't have to offer those things, try to offer them by ourselves. We can't. But Mary is there to help us. And all the saints and angels, Jesus himself is there. We don't do this alone. We do this that with the the help of heaven. It's heaven and faith, not only because we see the glory of God, it's heaven and faith because all the citizens of heaven are, have taken our side and are helping us to make our hearts a heaven for the living God. You know, I, I can't help but think that, you know, you bring up the Blessed Mother in, in that moment when we have to enter into this, into this uh, purification or whatever that might be that you're being called to that she she's standing you know she stands at the foot of the cross and those saints they stand they stand with us don't they i mean that's what gives you the courage to to stand ourselves isn't it i mean that's we don't fall down into a crumble but we're held up by them i mean is that is that too dramatic of an image anthony no no um uh, actually, my heart is going back to to World Youth Day in 1993. Hundreds of thousands of young people gathered at Cherry Creek State Park singing, uh, We are one body, one body in Christ, and we do not stand alone. We stand with one another, not only with one another, with uh, earthly family and friends who, who uh, are struggling to live the, the life of faith, but we stand with all our brothers and sisters who preceded us in the faith. And they stand with us. They choose to take our side and to stand with us. Um, and, and most of all, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Jesus has given us Mary to stand with us, his own mother. He, he, has, he has asked her to stand with us so that we do not stand alone. When we are united with Jesus, we are never alone. And it's a very powerful image of heaven and faith. And anyway, my my um, own memory goes back to that World Youth Day where we were singing that, and we were standing together, and uh, with John Paul II, Saint John Paul II, you know, leading us to um, to uh, not only not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ but to be proud of the gospel of Christ, to shout it from the rooftops. When we know that we're not standing alone, we can offer this surrender of love, and this is what gives us strength to shout the gospel of Christ from the rooftops. Well, I pray to God that we're able to stand. Amen. You know, I just pray. I just pray that we, we access that, that beautiful mystery that Elizabeth is bringing to us. Um, and you too, Anthony. Any final thoughts on this particular letter? Well, thank you for you know asking that we actually reflect on this letter uh, and the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. The Church is called the Eucharist. Uh, it, it, one of its titles is Viaticum. It's what we give people who are sick and dying under Viaticum. 
what that means is it's, it's bread for the journey. And the bread that we have from the journey is no less than the, the body and blood of Jesus. Unless we eat this bread and drink this cup, we don't have, we have no life in us. But when we eat this bread and drink this cup, even if we die, we live. Because his life is real life. His, his body is real food. It, it sustains us. And in this, this time, it's like the church is, is very sick right now. And we've been very sick for some time. Bread for the journey is going to strengthen us so that we can get back up and continue to follow our crucified God. This bread is healing for our souls. And it's healing because with this bread, we find the strength we need to make room for the word to dwell in our hearts. With that word, a deeper silence and peace, a silence and peace that the whole world needs. With this bread, we find that place where we are standing with our brothers and sisters and we do not stand alone. With this bread, we find that surrender of heart, that penetration of the mystery of God and that bond with him. And in that bond and in that penetration of the word, something happens to us, something very beautiful. So thank you, Chris, for bringing our attention to this beautiful letter and to the Blessed Sacrament. And I hope today that those listening to the, this conversation will make a little bit of time and space in their lives for the Blessed Sacrament, too. Thank you so much for your time today, Anthony. Thank you, Chris. Have a great day. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. We'd like to take this moment, too, to thank Miriam Gutierrez, who provided the voice for St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lullis.